Hi everyone, welcome back. We call that in the first lecture. Uh, I mentioned this main results of us. Uh, we have that every countable group is the outer automorphism group of some property T, a synergically hyperbolic group. In this lecture too, I would like to sketch the proof of these results, or at least a key step of the proof. This key step is that given an arbitrary automorphism, we want to have some control of the automorphism. We want to say that it maps, uh, well, it, it, uh, for a specific element, it maps that specific element to another specific element's exception. We will see more details later. And this step is done using auxiliary subgroups H1 and H2, okay? Where H1 is the direct product of Z with Z mod 2Z. And it has generators S and X, such that S square is the identity and S commutes with X. And H2 is the group Z times Z of 3Z, uh, where the generator is a T and Y, and T cube is the identity, and T commutes with Y. Okay, and for simplicity, I will denote X squared by A and Y cubed by B. Uh, under this notation, I would like to make the following observation. So suppose I look at an automorphism of the free product of H1 and H2, then the claim is that you can find an automorphism psi which stays in the same inner class of the automorphism phi, such that uh, psi maps A to A to some power alpha, alpha equals uh, one or minus one, and psi maps B to uh, B to some part our beta conjugated by some element Z, where alpha beta equals uh, plus or minus one, and Z is an element of the free product, some element of the free product. And to convince you about this observation, the argument is fairly simple. So first, uh, we notice that every finite order element of the free product conjugates to one of uh, one as T and T squared. And then if you compose this by, an, so, well, we know that phi maps S to S conjugated by something, right? And well, because S has uh, order two and phi has to map S to some order two elements. So phi maps to S to some conjugates of S by conjugating everything using an inautomorphism, we may just assume that phi maps to maps S to itself and phi maps T to t to some epsilon power conjugated by z or z inverse, where and z inverse where epsilon is a uh, plus or minus one and z is an element of the free product. Now you look at the centralizer. The centralizer of s is h one and the centralizer of t is h two. Since phi maps S to itself, phi has to map this centralizer to itself, and phi has to map the centralizer of T to some conjugates of H2. And just observe what happens at the level of the element X. Well, phi maps S to one of the following, and phi maps Y to one of the following, okay? And since A equals X square, B equals Y square, we, well, if we square everything and take a cube of uh, everything, we get exactly that I have such equal such equalities, okay? And this, these things are done by using an inautomorphism. So psi in general only lives in an inner class of phi. Okay, so this is the first observation. And already here we see that given an arbitrary automorphism of the free product, I am able to say something about the, this automorphism. It has some specific property. And we also notice that these powers alpha and beta, well, uh, we don't like them. This element Z, we don't like them. And I want to say whether it's possible to get alpha equals one beta equals one and Z is the identity. And this is done using a, using small cancellation theory. And what we do is we take a quotient of the free product by an element by a relation 
by the normal subgroup generated by the product A, B, A square, B square up to A to the N, B to the N. And this double angle notation denotes the normal closure in the free product. Okay. And the small cancellation theory, we call what it is. It is that, well, first you recall that uh, a way to write down a group is to write down its generators and relations. And relations, they combine together to form a word representing the identity. And usually I think about a relation as a polygon in the KD graph, like this one. And another relation is another polygon, like this one. And these two polygons, they have overlap. And you, you just ignore the overlap. You get a new word, it represents identity. And you can keep going like this. And in general, those relations, they can combine with each other in a very complicated way to form a word representing the identity. And in fact, you have finitely presented groups uh, with a non-solvable word problem. So already it, with, for some finite presentation, you cannot tell whether I give you a word, you cannot always able to tell, be able to tell whether the word representing the identity or not. Small cancellation requires uh, that the, those relations, they cannot have large overlap. Okay, and when those relations cannot have large overlap, they have to be combined in a specific way. And if a word represents the identity, then you can see at least half of one of the given relations. Okay, this is called a green ninja snapper. And this makes it easier for you to tell whether a word represents the identity or not. Given you a word, you search for half of the relation on it. And when you see such a piece, you replace that half by another half of the relation and usually shorter half. And then you just keep going and you can keep reducing the word further and further because the total length of the word will be decreasing and the process will stop and you will end up with something either it doesn't contain half of a given relation. So in this case, the word does not represent the identity or you just represent, you just reduce the words all the way to the trivial words. In this case, the word, the word you start with represents the identity. Okay. All right. So this is the Green Ninja's lemma and we are going to make use of this lemma in our quotient to say something about automorphism. So we call that we have this equation. The Green Ninja's lemma then says, well, uh, H1 and H2 maps injectively into triple H. Why? Because if I am given a word, so the, an element of H1, well, it's just that single element is a word, a single letter word. And you search for half of the relation of a relation on its, well, uh, of this given relation on its, uh, well, this is not possible unless your word is just the identity. Okay. And second, every finite order element of Tudor H conjugates to one of one st t square. Well, the reason is that a finite order element is given by a specific relay, a specific words, right? If you have a finite order elements, then you have a word, the word you repeat it finitely many times, you get identity. So you get a word representing the identity and you can run the green ninja's lemma on it. And also centralizers, we have those centralizers. The reason is that, well, if an element lies in the centralizer, then it is a rule such that you conjugate, well, or such that the, it's commutator with S, say it's a centralizer of S, then the word, the commutator of the rule with S is the identity. And then you can run the green ninja's lemma on it. Okay, anyways, so it's not hard to show that uh, our free, our small cancellation quotient has these three properties. And these are exactly what we use in lemma one. So we can run exactly the same argument in this situation. Given an element phi in the automorphism group of Tudor H, you can just use the argument of the first lemma to show that uh, we can modify phi by an inner automorphism and assume that phi of a equals a to the alpha of power, phi of b equals b to the beta of power, conjugated by some z. And in fact, we can do better. 
we can modify phi by an inner automorphism and get an automorphism psi such that psi fixes A and B. And the idea is to look at the following root A to the alpha of power times that times B to the beta of power times that inverse all the way to, well, to the nth power. And you notice that this root is obtained by applying uh, phi to every single letter of uh, this word we use to form the small cancellation quotient. Okay, that means this guy represents the identity. And then we can run Green Ninja's lemma on it to argue that, well, if you think about your, let's say, if you think about polygons representing by those words, the polygons have uh, overlaps. Right, so all the polygons, you can see half of the relation on the boundary of a polygon. And well, in terms of words, that's saying that's uh, the words we have and some cyclic permutation of uh, this small, this word we use to form a small cancellation condition, a small cancellation quotient or its inverse have large overlap. Okay, so, but then you look at the structure of these two words and do some combinatorics. That's not hard, but, uh, well, it's easier to do by hand rather than to explain. So you can look at the structure of these two words and convince yourself that uh, in this case, alpha equals beta equals one, and that is the identity. And just by the structure of those words, but then, if alpha equals beta equals one and z equals the identity, that means precisely because uh, alpha appears here, beta appears here, z appears here, that means precisely that sine of a equals a and sine of b equals b, okay? So we are, so in this quotient triple h and an arbitrary automorphism phi, we are able to say that Phi up to some inner automorphism, phi fixes A and B, okay? And this is the observation we are going to use. Now let's come back to the main theorem. Every countable group is the outer automorphism group of some property T, a cylindrically hyperbolic group, okay? And to start with the proof, uh, we will start with the following results of Olivia and Weiss, which we already mentioned in the first lecture but uh, in a not that precise form. Now this one is a precise form. It says that for every countable group Q, you can find a short exact sequence uh, such that N has property T and the map from Q to the outer automorphism group of N by conjugation is injective. Okay, let me first explain what this map is. Well, for any element of Q, you want to get some automorphism of N. And the way you do it is that you get an element from this quotient group, you leave it to an element H of uh, this group H, and then you conjugate N by the element H. Well, because N is a normal subgroup, you will just get an automorphism of N, okay? And well, because we start with an element Q and we choose some lips, we can choose another lips, but different lips, uh, the automorphism induced by different lips will differ by an inner automorphism. So you get a well-defined map from Q to the outer automorphism group of N, okay? And Olivia and Weiss were able to construct this short exact sequence such that this uh, map is injective. And in general, it can be neither injective nor subjective, okay? And so this is our starting point. What we do is first we take uh, the group H from this uh, theorem. And then we take a free product of H with H1 and H2, where H1 and H2 are the ones I wrote down uh, in the last several slides. And first we will form the quotient. Okay, so we need to do some preliminary steps. First we form the quotient. So E naught is a quotient of this free product. But also we are we would do it in such a way that E not in fact E not is a quotient of H. How does that work? Well, first I would just uh so G not is a quotient of N. So what you do is you uh, identify every element of H one and H two with some elements of N. Okay, 
So after this first step, you well, and you do it in such a way, such a that uh, H1 and H2 maps injectively into the quotient. So you can get that H1 and H2 maps injectively into G0. And I will explain those steps in further details, but this is well, just a sketch of the main idea, okay? The first step is that you form a quotient such that uh, this first, this is a quotient of H and second, I can merge H1 and H2 into G0. I use G0 to, I, I use N to eat H1 and H2 and then G0 is a quotient of N. So after eating H1 and H2, N becomes a quotient, this is G0, okay? Uh, second, I will form a new quotient, which is E1. E1 is a quotient of uh, E0. Oh, sorry. So this is, uh, and G1 is a quotient of uh, G0, okay? I form such a quotient, and in such a way that G1 is generated by A and B. So before, I only know that H1 and H2 embed into G0, but G0 can be much larger than the subgroup generated by A and B. But by forming a further quotient, I ensure that G1 is generated by A and B, okay? And then after that, the last step is you will form the quotient, which is E1 more out this uh, small cancellation condition, okay, for large enough N, and G will be the quotient of uh, G1, okay, the corresponding quotient of G1. And after you get this small cancellation quotient, you want the argument. So our observation we have before we have an observation which controls an arbitrary automorphism, and you can want the same argument here in this quotient group, uh, and then uh you say that okay every automorphism of G you are able to say that it's uh it's going to fix uh A and B up to some conjugation by an element of E. So every Automorphism is induced by a conjugation of an element of E, okay, and that and that way you get some control of the automorphism, and also we construct the sequence so so that's uh well in along these quotients we construct the sequence so that's uh well G is a normal subgroup of E right and E quotient out by G is exactly this given countable group Q, okay. Uh, so we will get that. Uh, we will we are able to obtain that in after this quotient. Uh, the map from Q to the outer automorphism group of G is surjective, and then what you do is you use well the whole process is done using theory of a cylindrically hyperbolic group, and then you are able to argue that the map is also injective, and thus get in such an isomorphism. So this is roughly the idea. Okay, but anyway, so how does these two steps done? So I mean, by step one and step two, I mean these two steps, how are those done by using small cancellation of a cylindrically hyperbolic groups? Well, first, uh, let me mention, so let me mention a bit about a cylindrically hyperbolic groups. Those were introduced by Olsen, generalizing hyperbolic and relatively hyperbolic groups. And those has the, well, this is a large class, and in fact, uh, in the results of uh, the aforementioned result of Olivia and Weiss, the group H appear here is a graphical small cancellation group. And a results by Gruber and Sisto says that graphical small cancellation groups are cylindrically hyperbolic. Okay, so that's why we, the theory of cylindrically hyperbolic groups uh, pops up uh, in this argument, right? Uh, cylindrically hyperbolic groups have a nice small cancellation theory. Uh, for example, below is one of the results we use many times in, pro in the proof. So let G be an cylindrically hyperbolic group and you can find a so-called suitable subgroup, which is S. It's, you can imagine this as a large enough subgroup such that uh, whenever you get a finite set, you can form a quotient such that S eats the finite set. Uh, well, formally, that means for any finite set F, 
you can find a quotient like gamma such that gamma f is contained in gamma of s and g bar is a cylindrically hyperbolic which ensures that you can win this argument many times because each time you get an cylindrically hyperbolic group you can keep going okay so how does this help in our argument well we call that we want to do these two steps we want to form the quotients Okay, the first step you will do, well, H1 and H2 embed into G0. So uh, what you do is H1 and H2, it's the normal subgroup and it's H1 and H2 to form the quotient G0. So what you do is the suitable subgroup is going to be N and F is just a generating set of H1 free product with H2. But then after taking a quotient, you see gamma F is contained in gamma of N, right? And then, then gamma of N is G0. So H1 and H2 now embed into G0. The second step can be done in a similar manner. In this case, you pick your suitable subgroup as the subgroup generated by A and B. And F is a general rating set of N0. So this suitable subgroup, it's the generating set of N0. So N0 is contained in this uh, in the quotient of this subgroup but also you notice that n naught because it contain because oh sorry g naught sorry g naught but also you notice that g naught contains uh this uh, suitable subgroup a and b because this suitable subgroup is a subgroup of, is a subgroup of the subgroup generated by H1 and H2. So you get exactly that G0, uh, you get a quotient G1 and G1 is generated by A and B. So this is how you do the first two steps. And then the remaining is like using the observation, the argument of the ob observation I mentioned uh, a few slides uh, well, in a before, okay? So this is the idea how you prove the main results. And in the very last of this talk, I would just like to mention what's next. Uh, what, what are all these leading to? Well, as I mentioned in the first talk, that's uh, if you want to construct an auto uh, uh, group for Neumann algebra LG, such that its auto automorphism has, is a prescribed countable group, then a way a way to do it is that you first construct a countable you construct a property t group g such that it has a prescribed auto automorphism and you try to prove that its von Neumann algebra has the same auto automorphism group as itself. Uh, so we have done the first step in this talk. We get a group g with prescribed auto automorphism, and then the next step is that you want to prove that its auto automorphism group has the same von. Uh, uh, well, its von Neumann algebra has the same outer automorphism group as itself. And for the moment, we are able to do that for all finitely presented groups. Okay, so this is the theorem we obtain. And we are still not able to get uh, all countable groups. And because uh, for finitely presented groups, we are able to use some operator algebraic techniques. Uh, but those are not available in the more general setting. So an interesting and direction will be how to do this for all countable groups. But I will stop here. Thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.